We had a number of people that had struggled with addiction, substance abuse, alcoholism, and very different stories, but they had a similar theme to them. And to the point that when we were first launched, many people thought that's what we were about, mm. was we were more a counseling service for that. Mm. But as time has gone on, we've, we've seen a little bit of lessening of that, but a whole lot more on the anxiety and mental health side. Even within the church, it's a struggle. Mm. And people need to have answers when they come across those types of issues in their lives. You're listening to God Hears Her, a podcast for women where we explore the stunning truth that God hears you, He sees you, and He loves you because you are His. Find out how these realities free you today on God Hears Her. Welcome to God Hears Her. I'm Erin Eddy Atkins. And I'm Elisa Morgan. What do you think of when you hear to put God first? Does serving come to mind? Telling your story? Or maybe you think of ways to put God first in your daily life. Today, we are so excited to talk to the Vice President of the I Am Second Ministry. John Humphrey has been with I Am Second since its launch in 2008, and he continues to help produce the films. He and his wife, Kathleen, have two daughters. Let's start out our conversation by learning about John on this episode of God Hears Her. I came across... I am second, and I experienced vulnerability that was new to me, and it was beautiful, and it changed me. Mm. And so I'm really excited that you are here with us today. Mm. (laughs) Well, thank you for having me, and certainly authenticity is at the heart of everything that we do, and so we encourage transparency with the people that we work with to tell their stories, and it's not something that is easily done, so we're, we're very appreciative of those that go ahead and are willing to share their story and to have that transparency. Before we go deeply into the I Am Second mission, which we want to do, because I have a feeling you're gonna help us learn to tell our own stories better as well. Tell us a little bit about yourself. You know, Where are you from and uh, what's your life been like and maybe a couple of your crossroads and how'd you end up here? Wow, that's uh, quite a journey. And be and vulnerable. I'll, I'll, I'll... <laughs> Just be vulnerable while you're doing it, okay? Just tell uh, us your whole good. life all real quick. That's right, that's right. Yeah. Authentically. Yeah. <laughs> well, gosh, uh, you know, I grew up in a, in a Midwestern, Northeastern family. We were born in Ohio, lived most of my formative years in the Pennsylvania area, mm-hmm. went to college down in the state of North Carolina, and that's where I met my wife. But all throughout that journey there, I was drawn to sports. Went ahead and uh, started out a career to have a career in sports media, sports athletic administration. And uh, that's the direction that I went into. But even along the way of that, I was drawn to stories within the sports context because there's something about sports that I could see the best in people. I was drawn to, to stories of redemption and stories of people who overcame odds. And that played out even in some of the projects that I got involved with early in my my sports media career. Then I had the opportunity to go ahead and start my own company in media, and I was able to delve even deeper into that. But it got to the point where my business partner and I and our company, we decided that, okay, it's been a good 10-year ride, but let's go ahead and separate. And I went through a two-year period of what is God gonna do next in my life? And You know, I had put in 20 plus years into sports media and I enjoyed it and I felt that God had really placed me there, but I wasn't able to move on to the next job, the next chapter. So I I was consulting with companies, but I kept applying to sports network positions, major sports companies, and I would get up to the very last round and lose out to the internal candidate. It happened like four or five times in a a row. And it was just, it was just crazy. And so... I can I remember it got to the end of one year and I was just went before the Lord and I said Lord I don't know why you would do this but if you want to end this run in sports I'm okay with that you know I don't know where you'd move me on to but I just want to be obedient to what you have in store for me mm-hmm. it, was, it was about two months later that I got a call from a ministry friend who said, John, 
we've just had this project come about in our ministry. And I think it has your name written on it. Would you like to come and talk to us about that? And that was the I Am Second project. And uh, I've been now involved with it for 13 years, helped to get it launched and stayed with it since. But that focuses in on my, my work journey. Mm -hmm. But I'm a lot more than my work. Sure. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I, I'm a husband uh, to a wife. We've been married for 38 years. That's great. We have two da daughters that are now grown and married and this year just had babies of their own. You a new so grandpa. So I'm now a grandfather. Yay. <laughs> Along the way, I came to know the Lord uh, right before we got married, and and that was made such a huge impact on my life that I immediately threw myself into my faith. The different experiences that I've had in life have just layered on top of one another and allowed me to go ahead and to be in a position that I am now where I'm able to help facilitate people telling their own stories. I was really struck when you described your interest in sports as an interest in redemptive stories. I was like, wait, <laughs> that's like, doesn't seem cohesive. I mean, most people who talk about sports get into unique players and records, but you go to redemptive stories. You know, help us understand how you choose the word redemptive story, those two words to put with sports. Well, you know, it's, it's just like any storytelling approach. You know, somebody comes into the movie or the scene and they've got a problem. They've got an issue. Mm -hmm. And they're looking for somebody to go ahead and to assist them to find the solution to their story. And, you know, that's, that's the tried and true method of storytelling. And who's going to be that character that, mm -hmm. that's going to come in to assist them? Who's mm -hmm. going to be that helper? Mm -hmm. And we, we all have that in our lives. We all need that in our lives. We, for those of us who are believers, we've experienced that. And it's a situation that in sports, you can find that as well. It might be a coach. It may be another player. It could be somebody at a school that is assisting in, in, in the athletics department. But there's somebody that's gonna enter into the story and help resolve whatever issue it is that the person has in their life. That helps me understand your lens. And so it's through that kind of basic story outline of beginning, middle, and end, you know, character with a conflict and a resolution, etc. redemption, that you have come to this ministry. So tell us what I Am Second is. What does that mean? At its core, I Am Second means to be putting the things of Jesus ahead of yourself and the, and the needs of others ahead of yourself. And so that's the simple answer, is to be following Jesus and allowing him to work in your life to accomplish his purposes and serve the needs of others around you. So I am second is really keeping second things in second place and keeping first things, God, in first place. Mm -hmm. I've yeah. had lots of people say, oh, well, gosh, it's not I am second, you should be third. Oh. Or you, sh you know, and I, I tell the story that, you know, I walk into my house when I was, when, when my kids were there and I would be like, 450th. <laughs> right. <laughs> yes. That's a really great way to put it. What does I am second mean to you personally? A lot of different levels. Uh, you know, if you look at it from the guiding principle level, obviously it's a great reminder. I, you know, I have my wristband on. It's a constant reminder for me, but it's also a reminder for me to be sharing my faith with others. And so from that as it's a very much a guiding principle. Mm -hmm. When we look at the I'm second activity that we've had here, it's mm -hmm. again something that I felt that, uh, that God has had prepared me for mm -hmm. and to step in and provide direction and guidance when it was needed, when it was first getting started, and then to help be the hand on the tiller of activity that we've had to keep us focused and making certain that we accomplish our daily activities. Tell us how it works. This is cinematography and filmmaking that we bring to bear on these. And everything that we do is very intentional. It's, it's to come up with a quality level that people don't have to apologize for. Mm. That was one of the, the standards that we wanted to hit was that you could put this on a video and not have to apologize to something. Well, it's something that I came across and I know the quality's not that great, but listen mm -hmm. to it. 
Okay. Mm -hmm. We wanted people to feel comfortable about sharing it with other people. The films themselves are first person narratives, basically a person's testimony. What we do though, is we film the testimony and we narrow the focus of what the, what they are, were really trying to communicate. But mm -hmm. the end result is a film that's usually what we call our white chair films because they're sitting in a white chair. Mm -hmm. That can be anywhere from five minutes to 12, 13 minutes for the most, of, most part. We've had a few others that have been longer or we have other films that are in different formats, mm -hmm. but the white chair film testimony is, is basically the standard that we, that we go ahead and do. What I admire so much about the films that you guys have released is that they really are raw and honest. So what are some questions that you ask the person in the white chair to bring that out and for them to feel safe? Well, here are some of the behind the scenes things that, that we do. Our questions, we do not ask typical questions. Hmm. What we do is everything that we do leading up to conducting the interview is done with intention. And we first create an environment that helps people focus and be reflective. Mm -hmm. We do that in the way we have our room, on how we greet people, how we talk to them in some telephone sessions prior to it, then when they arrive, how we speak with them there. And so they know what they are getting into, and we try to lock down our interview so that it is very focused in on them. It's a dark room, very few people in the room. We have one person asking questions. That person is off to the, off to the side rather than in front. Mm -hmm. They sit down in the chair. They've got one light above them. And so already, you know, they're feeling like they are in the middle of everything. Mm -hmm. And then we go ahead and we let them talk first. Mm. And they go ahead and share what they feel their story is. And then we listen very intently and we kind of know where it's going because we've already mm -hmm. talked to them, mm -hmm. but we listen what comes out of their mouth first. And then we start asking the questions for clarification after mm -hmm. that and ask them to go deeper about certain things. So, mm -hmm. it, you know, we let them start the conversation. We don't start it for them. Wow, that is so sensitive and provocative as well. I mean, the way you first began to describe that, I felt like I was in a, a police officer's <laughs> interview room. Mm -hmm. And there may be some element of that because you're actually accessing the truth in a human being. Well, it could be. Um, one thing I didn't say that it was very important, but we pray before every, mm -hmm. every interview. It's very uh, deliberate in how we pray. And we pray that God will go ahead and bring clarity to their mind mm -hmm. and allow them to perhaps even say things they've never thought about before. Wow, wow. Mm -hmm. so the Holy Spirit's super involved. It, in absolutely. That. Can you give us some examples of some of the I Am Second stories? You know, what are their topics or what's been a pop that has surprised y'all or even the person as they shared? Well, you know, when we first started, just from the nature of some of the people that we were filming, we had a number of people that had struggled with addiction, substance abuse, alcoholism, and very different stories, but they had a similar theme to them. And to the point that when we were first launched, many people thought that's what we were about, was we were more a counseling service for that. Mm -hmm. But as time has gone on, we've, we've seen a little bit of lessening of that but a whole lot more on the anxiety and mental health side. Even within the church, it's a struggle. Mm -hmm. And people need to have answers when they come across those types of issues in their lives. Mm -hmm. And so we do go ahead and talk about the need for healthy counseling and how that can be helpful, but also of how important attitude and focus on the Lord and the Lord's leading and prompting and acceptance and submission and all those different things and how that all works together. Can you share one of the stories that particularly impacted you? <laughs> well, we have 150 of yeah, them. Yeah, yeah. And, and others. But I would say this, there are some stories that are just fun to be a part of. Mm. You all know them, you've seen them, they're celebrities, uh, you know, the Mike 
Fishers and Carrie Underwoods and the Robertson family and Albert Pujols and you know singers and actors and mm -hmm. and all that sort of thing and it's fun to be around and there are moments in there that I take away and and, and I file them away and say yeah that was a great moment mm -hmm. but there are a number of people who maybe I didn't know their them for who they were but their stories stayed with me and then what's what's really neat is again building that relationship with them over the years and following them as they've gone into other ministry activities mm. you know one of those was a woman by the name of Karen Green and Karen was a, here in the, she was one of the very first that we filmed in Dallas Fort Worth and she uh, had been a prostitute mm -hmm. and yet she had escaped that life and at the time she was on the side of a regular job was ministering to those ladies and helping them through the uh, judicial system and getting them placed into help as to where they could move on and transition in life. So she, she did the film with us. Well, then she got fired from her regular job after the, mm. the film came out oh, wow. be, because of her past. Mm -hmm. And so then she said, okay, this is the way it's going to be. I'm going to go full blast into ministry. And ever since that we've come alongside of her and helped promote what she does. Mm -hmm. And she's got a thriving ministry called the Haven of Love. And mm -hmm. it, it has really made a difference in the city. Mm -hmm. uh, that's, wow. that's one. Another that's is, one. Mm -hmm. is a fellow by the name of uh, Jim Monroe. And Jim came to us with a story about his bone marrow transplant. And the story... It was so much an example of what Christ did for us in that uh, his bone marrow had to be killed. Then he had this blood transfusion that he was given that regenerated life into him that was provided by a young woman. Oh, it's profound. Wow. And so, again, Jim's a good friend that has come out of that association. And we followed his ministry activities and the jobs that he's had since then and the impact that he has made. I could go on and on, but those are just two. So the goal of each story, maybe could you put that in the, the mission's words, you know, what are you really trying to demonstrate sure. in each film? Well, the first thing comes, it's, it's inspirational. Mm -hmm. uh, we want people to see an authentic story of a person who's had a real encounter with Jesus and how that can transform lives. If a person is a believer already and they encounter that story, we want them to be encouraged and to be motivated to continue to grow their own faith. If a person is seeking or maybe they're a new believer and haven't yet you know, really made a commitment to growing their walk, we want them to be curious and to keep watching films to the point that they ask some critical questions in their life. Yeah. And usually that comes when somebody is experiencing difficulties in their life, mm -hmm. and yet they see someone who's in the exact same position they were, yeah. and yet they were able to go ahead and at their lowest point find an, an alternative solution, something that they hadn't thought of. Mm. And so when they see the example of someone turning to, to Jesus, to following his lead in their life, and it's moving away from the desperate situation that they had been in, it gives them encouragement and they say, maybe I can do that too. And they are willing to go ahead and take that step in trusting Jesus. Mm. That's so powerful. What I love is that y'all really do remind people that their story matters to God, all of it, every bit, every nook and cranny of it. What would you say to the woman that's listening that feels like her story doesn't matter or it's maybe she hasn't hit a rock bottom moment for it to matter yeah. or she's really having a hard time with embracing whatever her story is and sharing it mm -hmm. with somebody? So many people think they don't have a story. Right. And they think that I'm not an alcoholic. I didn't have issues with my parents. I didn't go through these things. And so, you know, when I accepted the Lord, I just did it out of faith. Well, that's a story. Yeah. Because there was a moment in their life that they accepted the Lord. Mm -hmm. And they can look back, and this is what we, how we teach people to tell their story is, you know, what, what were you before you made that commitment of faith? Mm -hmm. What are two words that describe you? Mm -hmm. 
It may not be that you were crazy or you were hurt, but all of us, our old selves, have words that describe what we were like. So what were those two words? In my case, I was prideful mm -hmm. and I was a control freak. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I wanted to be in control. Mm -hmm. But then somebody introduced me to Jesus. I met a man that introduced me to Jesus and that Jesus was the one that was in control mm -hmm. and not me. And then you turn your attention to since then, I have been, and you pick two words that describe what your life has been since then. Mm -hmm. So you can tell that story that. in 30 seconds or less. What are the two words that describe you now, John? <laughs> I'm trusting in Jesus. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I won't want to say that I'm humble, but I'm not as prideful. I've been serving rather than living mm -hmm. for myself. Mm -hmm. And let me, let me try it. And maybe each listener can think about this. I would say before Jesus, I was alone and inadequate. And mm -hmm. since I found Jesus and he found me, I'm in community mainly with him. He is my first friend. And he is enough, which fills all the holes of my inadequacies. Mm -hmm. mm. You want to do it, Erin? Yeah, I'm thinking. Mm -hmm. I would say I was prideful and self-sufficient. And I'm now dependent on him and tender. So those are great examples. And boy, I think people listening were really going to connect. I'm also thinking about somebody who doesn't have a super clear before and after, if you know what I mean. I mean, it's been more of a progression, a, a lifelong walk with God. And maybe even after you have that initial conversion, you know, change when you're not a Christian, you are, are there ongoing moments of discovery in your story where you used to be and now you are? Absolutely. And, and we actually tell some of those stories uh, within the I Am Second films. It's not always a conversion story that's featured in I Am Second. We, we have those moments. I can remember we went into a film with Tony Dungy, Super Bowl winning football coach, and we thought that we were going to get a football story out of him. But the story we ended up editing and producing was about how he lost his job, how he was fired as a coach. And why was that important? Because there were a lot of men in 2009 at, when we filmed him that were being fired or let go from their jobs. And so there's moments throughout the, your life that you know that God and the Holy Spirit is alongside of you. Sometimes that is a moment of triumph. Sometimes it's a teaching moment that you, you I learned this lesson. Or that's when it really became real to me about what Jesus had done for me. So those are moments that you may be aware of that you can still share with someone else. We talked a little bit about the before and the after. There are a lot of things I was before I was a believer that I can go back to. It doesn't have to be just two words. And so when I encounter somebody, I have about six, seven, eight words that I can, mm -hmm. I can play <laughs> off of there yeah. And that's why it took me a little bit of time to be on the other side. But mm -hmm. but I use those that are the most relevant to the person that I'm talking to. Mm -hmm. And so my life can have impact on their life. And we have a common bond that we can share and talk about mm -hmm. by referencing what we have experienced in our life. It doesn't have mm -hmm. to be the conversion story itself. He is first and we are second. You know, it's mm -hmm. interesting. I've listened and watched the films for some time too, and I was at the Museum of the Bible this past year, and I ran across one of those white chairs, and I just, I stood in front of it going, oh my goodness. I wanted so badly to go sit in it. <laughs> I just wanted to <laughs> plop my little self down in it, because it's it's a sacred space, you know, a, a story discovery, and therefore redemption discovery, change discovery. But I still, I have it in my mind. I think I took a picture of it. I love it. Well, did you uh, get a chance to look on the back of it? You know, maybe not. Tell us what's there. So what's on the back? Is it signed? John? Every person that sits in the chair signs the chair. Oh, That's beautiful. That. Okay. Oh. I think I missed that part. Oh, well. <laughs> I have to go back. <laughs> now, obviously, there's more than one chair. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. And, I gathered. <laughs> yeah. But the one up in the Museum of the Bible was the first chair. 
and therefore it has the most signatures on the back. Oh, that's I love beautiful. That. How many chairs do you go through? Well, we've got three right at oh, this time. Oh, that's good. Mm-hmm. That's a quality chair. <laughs> John, maybe could you just share, what is your prayer for women listening in terms of this concept of I am second? What what do you really hope they take away? Well, first of all, to know that their relationship with Jesus is what is the starting point and what matters. Mm -hmm. And if they lean into that, and I I know this from experience, you lean into that and let him show you the next steps in life, not the final step in you know, that ultimately that you want to get to, but the next steps in life, Mm. you know, with my daughters as they're going through being new parents, Mm. you know, sometimes it's just best for them to look and get through the day. Amen. That's such a wise grandpa right there. (laughs) You know, don't worry about what it's going to be a year from now. Mm -hmm. Worry what it is about today and just enjoy today Mm -hmm. and be obedient to what God has in store for you and your, your child that day mm-hmm. and and it's the same thing for any woman any man take those steps of obedience on a daily basis and he will go ahead and provide the ultimate destinations for you so that's mm-hmm. that that's one thing and mm-hmm. and i would also say that a concept of being second is akin to serving when you really get down to it i mean we serve all the time i serve all the time you know there's my family. I have to serve my family. I serve here in the office. I serve when I'm at church. I serve in my community. And it doesn't necessarily mean that it's got to be public serving, Mm -hmm. but to be placing the needs of others in front of yourself. That's the example that Jesus wants us to follow Mm -hmm. and to be in their lives and to serve them and to understand that it's it's not a chore. It's a privilege that you get to partake in that people by allowing you to serve them you know that they're giving you a privilege of helping out their life and so you know that's what we look at from an I am second standpoint going back to the story analogy we just feel very privileged that when people enter into the I am second ecosystem and they encounter our films and they watch a film and it helps to give them inspiration or it helps them to make a decision in their life or it brings them to a place where they accept Jesus as their savior. Mm -hmm. We feel very honored and privileged that we have Mm -hmm. been that helper on that journey, that God has enabled us to help them move on and to Mm -hmm. follow him deeper. I am so thankful that we had the opportunity to speak to John about what it means to be second to God and how important it is to share our story. Me too, Erin. Be sure to check out the I Am Second Ministry and their videos. You can find a link to their website and more on the website at GodHearsHer.org. That's GodHearsHer.org. Thank you for joining us. And don't forget, God hears you. He sees you and he loves you because you are his. Today's episode was engineered by Ann Stevens and produced by Mary Jo Clark and Jade Gustman. We also want to thank Daniel and Chris Cynthia for all their help and support. Thanks, guys. God Hears Her is a production of our Daily Bread Ministries.